In a prior video, we looked at what happens when someone rises from the lower card all the way up to the main event. But how about those cases where the opposite takes place? Yes, on occasion, a person who was on top of the world can fall all the way to the bottom. But what are the biggest examples of this? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into demotions, wrestlers who went from main eventers to jobbers. And if we're going to start anywhere today, let's do so with the biggest example of all, quite literally that is, because starting off strong during his early career, by the time the big show got to the 2000s, he was often portrayed as little more than cannon fodder for other, moreover, stars. How did this happen? Well, it's hard to say, because Paul White certainly had all the tools. After all, he had the size, a prerequisite for making it at the turn of the millennium, as well as the aura and the character too. Sure, he was never the world's best wrestler, but the sheer spectacle of him made up for that. Enough to where on his first night in WCW in May of 1995, he'd defeat Hulk Hogan to become the company's world champion. And because of this early success then, it was largely assumed that once he made the jump over to WWF in 1999, he'd be treated like one of the top stars in New York too. But while this may have been the case initially, pretty soon Vince McMahon began to sour on his newest signing. And that's what led to him sliding further and further down the card as time went on. Yes, there would be successes, such as the time The Big Show became WWF Champion in both 1999 and 2002, but in between those wins, there would be a fairly humiliating period where White was sent back down to developmental in order to improve his skills in the ring. And after his runs on top were over, it wouldn't be uncommon to see him getting pinned by the likes of Jeff Hardy or JBL. Of course, that has led us to the situation today where, rather than be remembered as a modern-day Andre the Giant, the Big Show is seen mostly as an upper mid-card act, one who, during his latter days in WWE, was mostly used to help others like Braun Strowman get over. Hell, even in his current home of AEW, he's more of a novelty act than anything, someone who spends most of his time on the commentary booth and rarely ever hits the ring. Sure, you could argue this is because he's semi-retired now, but had he been treated like a bigger deal during his peak years, a match against him today might still feel like a big deal, and not something which would look out of place on anything other than Rampage. Still, the situation is what it is, and there's little which can be done to change that now, just as there's little which can be done to change the perception of another former WWE champion who fell hard into jobberdom after the fact. Who are we talking about here? Why, Jinder Mahal, of course. Yeah, it's true that for most of his run, Jinder was little more than a comedy undercard act, something which was most evident during his time as part of 3MB. That said, all this would change very suddenly when, in 2017, Vince McMahon decided he wanted to push Mahal to the moon out of nowhere. Yes, on May 21st of that year, in the shock of the century, the boss booked Mahal to go over then-WWE champion Randy Orton in order to claim the belt for his own. That's right, it would have seemed unthinkable just a few years prior, but now Jinder Mahal was the top dog on SmackDown. Sadly though, this wouldn't last for long because following a pretty disappointing run, the company decided to pull the plug from the whole experiment when, in November of that same year, AJ Styles defeated the Canadian and from there sent him packing back down to the mid-card from whence he came. Of course, given how much he'd struggled in the main event though, the decision to do this to Jinder was understandable. And it seems he's made peace with this too, as since then, he's settled back into his old role of heel who can be mostly used to get other acts over, especially now that he had a little bit of extra added credibility to his name. But not everyone gets to keep that kernel of credibility after they fall from the main event down to the undercard. And if you need an example of this being the case, you only have to look at the way things went for Mike Awesome once he left ECW and went on to join both WCW and the WWF. Now, for some context for those too young to remember Extreme Championship Wrestling, it's really impossible to overstate just how much of a monster Awesome felt like during his time there. After all, when he wasn't having some of the hardest hitting bouts ever seen in America during that period against Masato Tanaka, he was winning a three-way dance against both Tanaka and Taz to become the ECW World Champion. Unfortunately though, any aura he'd built up for himself quickly dissipated once he moved over to Atlanta in April of 2000, as there, with Vince Russo now in charge of his creative direction, the Tampa native was given a series of god-awful gimmicks, which included the likes of the Fat Chick Thrilla and that 70s guy. So, needless to say, this saw him fall into the depths of jobberdom in record time, as any memories that he was once a feared figure were now well and truly gone. 
and it wasn't as if things got any better once he shifted over to WWF in 2001 either, because there, now having the stink of being a WCW guy on him to the New York audience, Awesome struggled to make any kind of impact with fans at all, leaving him to soon become someone incapable of even getting a match on Raw or SmackDown. Yes, by the time 2002 rolled around, the former ECW champion was pretty much a mainstay of sea shows like Velocity, with this being where he would remain up until the point that he was released from his contract later that year. Still, it could have been worse. He could have been kept around by Vince McMahon and forced to undergo even more terrible gimmick changes that further damaged his credibility, which is exactly what happened to Mabel when he morphed into Viscera, and then later, Big Daddy V. And yes, we know Mabel wasn't exactly a shining star towards the end of his time in New York either, but at least during his initial singles run as part of the WWF roster in 1995, he was being positioned as the boss's next big thing. Need any evidence of this? Then just look to the fact that, at that year's King of the Ring, ahead of other, arguably more deserving talent, such as Shawn Michaels or The Undertaker, the big man was booked to win the whole thing. Sure, the Philadelphia crowd who watched this live weren't exactly happy with such a result, but that did little to change the boss's mind on the matter. No, stubborn as always, he'd continue to push on with his plans no matter what audiences wanted, which is exactly why a couple of months later at SummerSlam, Mabel actually main evented in the world title bout against then-champion Diesel. Sadly though, this would mark the peak of the Goldsboro natives' time in the big leagues as, following a botch which almost crippled the champ, McMahon decided it was best to start phasing his new toy back down the card again. And this led to Mabel becoming such a nobody in such short order that, come January of 1996, he'd be gone altogether, never to be seen again until he returned in 1998 as the now rebranded Viscera. Of course, this wasn't exactly a main event gimmick either. Now, Viscera was mostly used as cannon fodder for people challenging the Dead Man's Ministry of Darkness that particular month. But at least it couldn't get any worse than this though, right? Well, as it turned out, it could get much worse because after a period as the Hugh Hefner-esque world's largest love machine, Nelson Frazier transformed again, this time into Big Daddy V. Who was Big Daddy V? Well, he was the jobber to end all jobbers who spent most of his time wrestling in ECW in possibly the worst ring gear known to man. That's right, if you ever want an example of what not to wear to the ring, just Google what the former king of the ring was adorning himself with in 2007 and 2008, and be prepared to see something which cannot be unseen. But even this doesn't represent the biggest fall from grace for a big man main eventer in WWE, because while he was briefly a top guy, Viscera's time in that role was ultimately short. When it comes to our next subject though, he was well established as a major heel in New York during the Golden Era, which was exactly what made it so sad to see Earthquake later return as Golga. That's right, playing the shark in WCW wasn't actually the low light of John Tenta's career. No, this would come a few years later, but let's rewind for a second because we feel it's important to emphasize just how important the Vancouver native was to the late 80s, early 90s audiences. After all, not many people can say that they got to destroy Hulk Hogan during his peak, but then Earthquake did just that. And because of such a dominating performance here then, it meant he'd be a made man for the rest of his time there. Hell, even when he was segued into a babyface tag team with Typhoon, they'd still be treated as a serious threat, one big enough to win the company's tag team titles at one point. That said, once Tenta decided to leave WWF behind in 1994 and instead move over to Atlanta, things started to change. Why was this? Well, poor booking there saw him lose much of his luster. So much so, in fact, that when the time came for him to return to his former home in 1998, right as the Attitude Era was kicking off, Earthquake was no longer deemed a main event worthy act. No, now the Canadian would be so low on the food chain that he wouldn't even be allowed to revive his once famous gimmick when he stepped back through the doors of New York. Instead then, he'd take on the new gimmick of Golga, a masked figure who served as part of the comedy jobber act, The Oddities. Yeah, it was quite a fall for someone who'd once been so feared by kids everywhere. But at the very least, John Tenta got to hide his face behind a mask for this one, so many people didn't even realize it was him at the time. That said, it was him, and it was a level of disrespect he wasn't willing to put up with for long, as by 1999 he once again left WWF, with him only returning one more time after that in his old Earthquake guys for the WrestleMania 17 gimmick battle royal. So at least once all was said and done then, the big man got to go out on something of a high, even if by this point he was a shadow of his former self, star power wise, 
Still, you could argue that he wasn't the person who had fallen the hardest by the time 2001 rolled around, as despite being a former WWF champion, come the turn of the millennium, Yokozuna had become little more than a punchline. Of course, a large part of this was because of the large amounts of weight he'd put on, making him barely mobile anymore as he wrestled all over the country on the indie circuit. And it was this same inability to get in shape which ultimately saw him fall from grace in New York, too. But it didn't have to be that way, because as we mentioned a moment ago, during his initial run under Vince McMahon, Rodney Anawaii was basically booked as the most dominating heel the company had seen since superstar Billy Graham. And that was exactly why, only six months after joining the roster in October of 1992, Yoko would shock the world when he beat Bret Hart for the WWF title at WrestleMania 9. Sure, he would lose it again to Hulk Hogan moments later in one of the worst booking decisions of the era, but by the time the summer rolled around, the big man was firmly back on top. And he'd remain in this position for the next 280 days then, all the way up until the point the hitman finally got his revenge at WrestleMania 10 the following year. Still, even if he wasn't the champion anymore, the San Francisco native was still a major player in the boss's arsenal. That was until he kept gaining more and more weight, however, and, in the process, became a liability to both himself and the company. So not knowing what else to do, WWF started phasing Yoko down the card, all with the caveat that, should he get back in shape, he'd be given his old spot again. Except he never did get back in shape, and so as the mid-90s went on, Rodney Anawaii became little more than a mid-card tag team act, someone who had to rely on his partner Owen Hart to do most of the work as he simply couldn't perform anymore. Then once he left New York in 1998, things got even worse as he got even bigger and less mobile, something which was most evident during his appearance at the infamous Heroes of Wrestling show in October of 1999. And sadly, not long after that, his weight issues would contribute towards his untimely death of a pulmonary edema at just 34 years old. But while this was tragic, at least his time in the main event is still what he's remembered most for now. It's just a shame the same can't be said for our next subject then because, despite a brief dalliance with the main event in early 2010's WWE, today Ryback is most well known for being equal parts jobber and Twitter troll. That's right, in 2023, the big guy is a shadow of the man he was back then, after starting a Goldberg-esque win streak on 2012 Raw. He got so over with fans that it looked like he might be the company's next breakout star. Hell, this was exactly what led to him being fast-tracked up to the main event scene later that same year when he subbed in for an injured John Cena to take on the then-WWE champion CM Punk inside Hell in a Cell. Unfortunately, though, this was also the moment that marked the downfall of Ryback, as just after losing to FTR Pepsi, his aura as an unbeatable force was immediately destroyed. And because of that, fans quickly started to lose interest in him, so much so that by 2013 he was relegated to being part of a comedy undercard tag team act with Curtis Axel. Yes, there were attempts to try and rehabilitate the Las Vegas native again following this, such as the time he won the Intercontinental title in 2015, but let's be honest, prior to Gunther's reign in 2022, no one had cared about the IC belt for decades, so Ryback landing it here did little to elevate him once more in the fans' eyes. No, all it really did was solidify him as a mid-card act who couldn't get the job done whenever the main event scene came calling. And eventually, such a reputation would see the big man be released from his WWE contract altogether. Still, at least Ryback can rest safe in the knowledge that he's not the worst off former Nexus member. No, for that honor, we have to look at none other than Wade Barrett. But how did things get to such a point with him? After all, upon debuting as the leader of the Nexus on the June 7, 2010 edition of Raw, it seemed like the former bare-knuckle boxer was a shoe-in for main event stardom, and a large part of this was because of how effective that debut was and how much it caught the wrestling world's attention as a result. That said, while the initial angle was a winner, as the weeks went on and the outlaw group became little more than a punchline for John Cena, it became apparent things were not going to work out as originally planned. But while this hurt all the members of the stable to some degree, no one was more badly tarnished than Barrett himself. Why was this? Well, because now, rather than being pegged to face off against The Undertaker at WrestleMania 27 and possibly even end the streak in the process, the Englishman was quite literally buried by Big Match John and then sent packing down to the mid-card for the rest of his run. And while he did manage to regain some sense of credibility again with the Bad News Barrett gimmick in 2013, 
Even this was eventually overshadowed by not only his run in one of the most forgettable stables of the era, the League of Nations, but also his time as King of the Ring during a period when that title never meant less. Had things been just a little different though, maybe things wouldn't have worked out this way and Wade Barrett would have been the main eventer he deserved to be. But while we can speculate about the truth behind that statement until the cows come home, one person we can't argue was ever going to have a better run following his debut in WWE was Vladimir Kozlov. And the reason for that is because this was a main event run which was never destined to last as Kozlov was simply too much of a late 2000s SmackDown creator wrestler to get over long term. Still, such a reality didn't stop Vince McMahon from trying to go all in with him at first anyway, as after debuting on the blue brand in April 2008, it wasn't long before the Kiev native was setting his sights on the WWE title. And who would the holder of that title be at this time? Why, none other than Triple H, of course. Still, it wasn't Reign of Terror Paul Levesque we're dealing with here, so rather than get buried when he went up against the champ, Kozlov actually put on an impressive showing. And while he wouldn't actually win the title, he came out of the whole thing looking like a bona fide main event star anyway. It's just a shame this wouldn't last then, because as the months went on and the rookie was booked to go up against people less talented than the game, it quickly became apparent that he just wasn't up to the task of being a top level player. So realizing this, Vince McMahon decided to rethink the direction of the big man's character when he instead had him morph into a comedy sidekick for Santino Morella. A role which, while it was a far cry from the killer he'd initially been portrayed as, at least it gave us the great moment of the two having a tea party for Sheamus. But for as fun as this was, it wasn't exactly where Kozlov wanted to be long term. Now, he wanted to be world champion, and it was his frustration over not being able to achieve this, combined with WWE's frustration over him not meeting their expectations, which led to him leaving the company behind altogether in 2011. What if he'd stayed though? Would he have been able to recover with time and at least start the process of rebuilding himself? Possibly. After all, in the case of our next subject today, while she's a far cry from the star she was upon her debut, at least there's still a glimmer of hope that Shayna Baszler could reach that next level again one day. For the time being, however, she's very much stuck in the role of Jobber who serves as both the tag team partner and pin eater for Ronda Rousey. But during her run in NXT, this couldn't have been further from the position she had there, as she was an MMA badass who liked nothing more than to tear her opponents apart limb from limb. Of course, with that pretty much being her real-life performer as a former MMA fighter, it only made sense Triple H would go in this direction with the Sioux Fall native. And it ultimately worked out so well for her that after beating Kyrie Sane in August of 2018, she'd go on to hold the NXT women's title for a full 418 days. So needless to say, it was expected that when Shayna finally made her main roster debut in March of 2020, she'd be a shoe-in for big-time success. And this certainly appeared to be the case when, at that March's Elimination Chamber, she dominated the competition and came out the number one contender to Becky Lynch's Raw Women's title. Sadly, however, such momentum would not last all the way up to WrestleMania as there, rather than dethrone the man, Baszler ultimately came up short and, in the process, looked like someone who simply wasn't able to get the job done when it counted. How would such a loss affect her main roster career going forward? Pretty negatively as it happened, because now beatable, the Queen of Spades fell into lower card irrelevance when she became, at various points, tag team partners to Nia Jax, Natalya, and then later Ronda Rousey. And Sure, you could argue that being in a team with Ronda should be doing wonders for her profile, but given how the former UFC bantamweight champion has fallen herself in recent months, this has not been the case. Still, as we mentioned a moment ago, there remains a glimmer of hope that Shayna will be able to get back into the main event picture at some point down the line. We just wish we could say the same for everyone else on this list too, but in the end, we can't because while they each had their moment in the sun, it's almost impossible to imagine any of those who are still living getting there again now.